Hello Year 12 and welcome to another lesson on Blake's songs, Innocence and Experience. So what I've got for you now is another Innocence poem and that is A Cradle Song. That's on page 78 in your anthology. So just to begin, I want you to have a little look both at the illustration on the right hand side to give you some emerging ideas as to what this poem could be about um, and have a little go at my learning start. So the poem potentially speaks then of the progression of a child. So what I mean by that is the movement of a child through their young life towards adolescence, towards the world of experience and adulthood. So without reading the poem fully yet, I've just snatched four very repetitive um, examples of uh, this within the poem. So it starts with sweet dreams, sweet sleep, sweet smiles, sweet moans. Now given that they are in chronological order from the poem, what could they be suggesting about a child's experience of young, their young life? So have a little go, pause the video now, can you come up with a quick idea? Okay, so let's have a little go looking at the poem. Um, hopefully you've read it by now, uh, but I'm going to read the first part to you just to start our ideas. So, a cradle song. Sweet dreams form a shade o'er my lovely infant's head. Sweet dreams of pleasant streams by happy, silent, moony beams. Sweet sleep with soft down weave thy brows an infant crown. Sweet sleep, angel mild, hover over my happy child. Sweet smiles in the night hover over my delight. Sweet smiles, mother's smiles, all the livelong night beguiles. Sweet moans, dove-like sighs, chase not slumber from thy eyes. Sweet moans, sweet smiles, all the dove-like moans beguiles. Sleep, sleep, happy child, all creation slept and smiled. Sleep, sleep, happy child, while o'er thee thy mother weep. Sweet babe, in thy face, holy image, I can trace, sweet babe, one like thee, thy maker lay and wept for me, wept for me, for thee, for all, when he was an infant small, thou his image ever seen, heavenly face that smile on thee, smiles on thee, on me, on all, who became an infant small, infant smiles are his own smiles, Heaven and earth to peace beguiles. So this is probably one of our longest poems that we've studied so far. Um, but interestingly, once again, as a song of innocence, it is full of repetitions, full of very similar lexical patterns. Uh, it sort of contains a very simplistic idea at the forefront. But like all of the innocent poems, it is deceptively simple. Okay, so what is it about? In a very kind of literal, basic meaning level, what we have here is a mother who is literally sort of lulling or crooning this lullaby to her child, her sleeping child. She implores, it seems that it might be some sort of guardian angel that she's imploring, but she's imploring someone um, to you know ensure that the baby is not disturbed that the baby's sweet dreams are not disturbed so while asking for peaceful sleep for the innocent babe she then weeps okay she then weeps for him or her as well in the latter half of the poem now obviously there's a little bit more to that and i'll go through some further ideas in just a moment but on a basic literal level year 12 that is what we're dealing with the poetic voice is a mother Okay, who, who seeks this utopian, idealised space of peace and protection okay, for this, this innocent child as well. So what sort of themes are we dealing with? Um, at the surface, if we're talking about parents, then we're certainly thinking about this theme that crops up a lot in Blake's work, and that is parental roles or paternal care, authority figures. Okay, now 
we know the actual authority figures within Blake's time were largely portrayed as oppressive forces within the life within, the, within sorry the life of children. Um, but the mother here, the poetic voice in this poem, she is the voice of innocence. She is this, in one way, idealised vision of parental care. However, like any innocent perspective, there is a limitation to this view. She has a largely blinkered view, not only of her child's life of its existence, but also of the creator. Okay, she references um, the creator on numerous times in the poet in the poem. Sorry, uh, she also compares the babe um, to Jesus and therefore to God. Uh, she says in the third from bottom stands a sweet babe in thy face. So in your face, sweet babe, the holy image I can trace. So the child here is an image of Jesus. Um, she speaks of that thy maker, your maker, um, and that's of course when Jesus became a child, okay, in, in, in the Joseph and Mary classical story that we all studied at primary school. So when Jesus became a child and wept for all creation um, that suffered for the sins of humanity. So she does seem to link the child to Jesus and therefore to the creator, but again has this very simplistic, blinkered, idealistic view of the creator she says in the penultimate stanza that jesus wept for me for thee which means for you and for all so she has this real inclusive vision of god's love of god god's benevolence and idealized care um the likelihood is that you know that blake thought if you only saw the creator through the innocent lens then you saw this meek and mild benevolent god um, but one that was ultimately vulnerable, vulnerable, sorry, to exploitation and naivety. Because that element of suffering is absent in this poem once again. Yeah, the fact that Jesus is said to have wept for all, that that inclusive pronoun um, is just extremely unlikely. Okay, because we know there are too many, uh, dis you know, elements of discrimination, prejudice, inequality, uh, abject poverty in Blake's time. Um, so that little note of idealistic inclusivity just seems really misplaced. Um, she seems completely ignorant, um, you know, to the veritable difficulties within Blake's contemporary world. Now, remember that phrase that, that joy and woe needs to coexist to find balance um, within life. And, you know, according to Bohem and other romantic thinkers, um, now in this poem, joy, joy is the only element that is ultimately allowed to dominate and to, to reign free here, to exist. Um, so we have, despite it being an innocent poem, a very human and a very flawed perspective. So what sort of context are we dealing with? A lot of this will be repetitive year 12 and don't worry about that. Let that liberate you. These poems, they all link together. They're all, they're all in symbiosis in terms of the ideas and the context that they're championing. So remember that phrase and it's something I would absolutely learn. Man was made for joy and woe and when this we rightly know, the world we rightly go. And of course, um, that's Blake there within one of his previous poems. And we must remember this phrase too. Without contraries, there is no progression. So in this poem, there's no progression because the nurse fails to achieve that idea of the coexistence of the contraries, joy and woe. They're not allowed to sort of coexist. The child is not being made for both of them. Okay, and so she is not preparing that child for the life, for the challenges that it will inevitably face. Okay, um, the coexistence of these contraries is actually first elicited in his book, The Marriage of Heaven and Hell. Um, and then, of course, he elaborates upon that pioneered idea within Songs of Innocence and Experience. So what is going on with, with the style in this poem? I've got lots of uh, lexical choices and phrases circled and highlighted in this poem because they're all very simplistic. There is a preponderance of simplistic lexical items, um, adjectives like sweet, lovely, pleasant, silent in the first stanza alone. 
okay so it's this very lim you know restricted uh lexical uh style that the mother has here um which i suppose could be a parallel to her lack of full understanding of the world um there's also of course an overwhelming sense of repetition sleep 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 i mean i would go through how many times does she say sleep or slept and how many times does she say sweet and sweet and sweet and hover and hover i mean all of these lexical items are jam-packed full with repetitions within the piece um there's lots of liquid sibilant sounds the whole way through as well um so you're looking for those sorts of uh alliterative or sibilant words that are really liquid okay so silent pleasant streams okay so it's, it's quite liquid and what i mean by that is there is this real sense of the fact that she's almost mirroring the soft comforting sounds that you would give to a child to lull it to sleep um you have that there as well okay so the language is really complementary in terms of the meaning of the poem as well um so characterization what are we dealing with here remember when we talk about things like characterization or structural repetitions we're talking about ao2 we're talking about author's methods um, within uh, your assessment objectives for the exam remembering that Blake is found within a paper two of your protest paper with the Hamid's Tower and the Kite Runner. So anyway, in terms of AO2, in terms of author's methods, characterization is a biggie. So we have the maternal figure here, of course she's a mother. She uses the whole way through um, frequent imperative verbs, things like weave thy brows and infant crowned and uh, hover over my happy child. That's in the second stanza. Basically, she's commanding in a way, using those imperative verbs, this guardian angel figure um, to protect and to retain this state of sleep for the child. Um, I mean, when you look at that verb hover, it's a persistent uh, dynamic verb to hover um, is, a, is a verb of regularity. So she wishes for this absolute protection, this recurrent protection from this guardian angel for her singular child. And again, it just comes across as rather ignorant, rather flawed in that perspective. Um, she is sort of absolutely fixated on the innocence of her own child um, and that's there as well um, we also have in the next stanza the third stanza sweet smile in the night hover over my delight sweet smiles mother smiles all the lifelong night beguiles so again loads of liquid sounds no, loads of sibilant loads of repetition loads of uh, imperative verbs there's really regular stresses on those lines as well so just to go back to her characterization then um once again she is persistent in her maternal wishes and desires she almost creates this incantation this charm like moment um she wishes for her child to retain absolute innocence and purity um and that's obviously a flawed idea that guardian angel is supposed to be hovering or to hover over the child and look whilst her intentions are undoubtedly fueled by love um, and benevolence at their heart her demeanor her behavior it's ultimately stifling and binding in its own way um if you look at the one two three the fourth stanza even the child's moans and the child's dove-like sighs and obviously dove-like suggest something quite gentle okay quite um unassuming something that's not brash or harsh but even those she wants even them to be eradicated she wants absolutely nothing to impede the peace um that the child is enjoying here okay um so it's, it's, a, it's a fantasy isn't it it's a fantasy what she's she's championing here okay so what i want you to have a go at is to pop down for me create a paragraph a speed paragraph that signposts point evidence explain develop and remembering in the explain we're zooming in on our choices on our author's methods and developing with effect on reader and link to context um the question is how is motherhood depicted in this poem in other words just 
how is how is she how is being a mother shown in this poem what is it what is it like okay what is it presented as so just to give you some little hints to get you started um i would look at you know the positive and the negative of motherhood in this poem there's certainly um this palpable maternal warmth in this poem which is clearly lacking in his experience poems you know it's one extreme in the other remember these are binary opposites um so we can talk about that maternal warmth care affection her idealized aspirations for the child but we must also consider in our paragraph the quite closed-minded sort of stifling uh blinkered vision that she has of her role and of the child's role in life as well okay um so let's be honest there's only really one point in this poem that's in stanza one two three four five um in the last line of stanza five year 12 where there is that tiny snapshot and remember the rules is a small snapshot a small moment a small shadow over the bright innocence of the poem where we see that lurking dangerous intimidating energy of experience sort of hover over the poem and that's when she says here that whilst the, ch the, ch the child is sleeping over thee thy mother weep she's saying over the child i i weep so for me that's just a tiny glimpse into this very fleeting it's very fleeting indeed she doesn't keep hold of it okay because she ends on smile and smile and smiles at the end um but there's a tiny moment of recognition here where she realizes that she cannot ignore entirely um what the child will go on to face in life okay what the child will go on to face in life and that is of course the idea of loss of innocence the stifling of the creative imagination the oppression from the twin mills those institutions um so is she weeping for the inevitable fate of the child despite her best efforts okay does she does she know a little bit more well if she does this is really important make sure you have this even if she does she's fleeting and ultimately it shies away she shies away from any true awareness any true awareness of the inevitable fate of the child and any true awareness of the need for coexistence of the contraries of joy and woe and that's actually what will safeguard the child that is what will prepare them for their life okay so remember if we're looking at this poem as telling us something about god or the creator during blake's time then again this poem is a warning uh, to contemporary readers that god their visions of god should not just be a projection of human needs and attitudes okay so she sees the child as purely fresh from god um and that in itself is a dangerous vision um if you fail to see the the veritable threats that that child will face okay so this is quite a complicated character in terms of what we have here we have this blinkeredness this stifling behavior but we have benevolence love and care but we ultimately have the idea that she chooses to shy away from true awareness okay and that makes her the innocent poetic voice that makes her vision limited okay so always remembering that top 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 quote there there it is for you okay and i've written there while well, she implicitly recognizes this she also shies away okay so i've got that there for you to take a moment and pause if you need those notes however you're going to give yourself about 12 minutes now to answer that question how is motherhood how is she as mother shown depicted illustrated in the poem you might want to plan this first by compiling a list of words and phrases that describe her or describe motherhood through the innocent lens off you go okay this is just a little slide here to remind you of some of the structure and sound notes that i gave before um you might have missed some of them so just pop this slide here for you to pause if you need to okay the last task and this is important because we need to for assessment objective four be 
teaming poems up okay be finding links throughout the collection so i want you now um to find for me another parental figure from one of the poems we've studied already and just make some notes down what is similar between those parental roles okay what is maybe different okay and look at how those differences or similarities are communicated now you've got poems that we've studied already when i say parental figure you take you can take it literal you can take it in the role the similar quasi role they might have like the shepherd um, and the nurses from the two songs as well okay so have a go at that i want a nice quick comparison do we notice here some similarities and differences between the parental roles between how they act okay you could just do a straight difference between innocence and experience or you could take two innocent poems and actually look for um, some of the key similarities that might exist there as well okay so this is going to take you about 12 minutes as well as your final activity pause now and have a go okay just make sure please that you have read a divine image um for next lesson it says wednesday there that it's it's for us it's for friday this year um but i, I won't be spending real really any key lesson time on this poem this is one of the ones that i want you to read to use cross ref it the website to go through and make some notes on um but there will not be a separate video on this one so it's up to you to go through and get your notes done for this poem okay so thank you very much guys thank you for joining me again um i hope this helps i hope this enables you to get everything you need down and remember if you have any questions all you need to do is to drop me a comment on the youtube below or of course to email me have a great day